everyone for joining. Uh, this is our Instagram live uh, feed with uh, none other than the blue collar footballer himself, Mr. Matt Barnes. Uh, Matt and I go back a very uh, a very long time. Um, back when um, I think we first met, probably I think it was about four years ago now. But even prior to that, we had a lot of dialogue, Matt. Uh, is a very, very uh, experienced coach. Uh, he's coached right across uh, different parts of the world, but most predominantly he was a, just to give you a little bit of background, a, a standout collegiate athlete himself. We'll get into his background in a minute. Um, he uh, coached across the NCAA at varying programs. He's coached at the semi-professional level, in uh, in the USA, he was a national team coach for uh, the Turks and Caicos, one of the island nations in the uh, Caribbean. And now he's the sports director at uh, Helsingborg, which is a professional club uh, in Europe. So, um, man, I'm, I'm just stoked to have you on board, mate, because uh, we, you know, we obviously uh, we've known each other for a bit, but. You know, we've 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 actually you know worked together one and all all, all of you who have uh, jumped on board in, in the capacity of you know being able to recruit players into college programs and the way that we interacted initially was Matt was the head coach at St Mary's University in uh, Texas NCAA Division Two program based out of uh, San Antonio and. Uh, I think I think the initial uh, uh, kind of uh, connection that we had and was when I I sent through some players and then we started some dialogue and then I think somewhere in between all of that and over the years you brought on a few of our recruits to St Mary's and then around right about that time I, I think I, I flew out for a graduation at Trinity University over there. At, uh, in San Antonio and then uh, ended up crashing on your couch that, for a that bit. seems like a lifetime I actually think we uh, started working um, when I was at San Francisco State because I think you had sent you had sent uh, uh, Aiden uh, that's correct one of your one of your kids from way back in the day so we're yep. talking quite a quite a while ago quite a while ago that's that one yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah, we uh, we kicked it off there, and then um, stayed in touch. And you know, it was, a, it was interesting. I think again, yeah, we met. I was crashing on your couch, and then uh, I think the first time I actually physically met you, I hopped in a car. Everyone was asking me where I was going. I said, "Look, you know, Matt." Yeah. Uh, Matt's up at Midland um, and they said oh you know hey Midland you got to go drive out there I said yeah and they go oh that's in the middle of nowhere so I ended up driving out in the middle of nowhere Matt was um, the head coach at that time with a NPSL uh, franchise a semi-professional franchise based out of Midland in Texas probably around about a four or five hour drive out of San Antonio um yeah, a few interesting kind of uh, segues in between on that journey and then ended up in the middle of nowhere. But, um, you know, we, we got to meet and then, uh, you know, I had such a great time out of Midland, man. I think I still remember seeing you as a coach, uh, seeing the way that you interacted with a lot of those players. You made it a real kind of family environment. And that, you know, that really allowed you guys to kind of, you know, with, with, a, with a young team, get out there and go all the way to the national national tournament there for the NPSL with Midland. It was a pretty historic run, but I think that was the first yeah, time we actually had come to meet each other, so that was Summer pretty cool. of 17, I think. So we we made quite a quite a cool run to the national championship. And That's right. I uh, ended up losing in the final, but... Um, I still think we would have won it if I would have had my, my full squad that summer. So it was a, it was a crazy summer with that. It's hard, isn't it? You know, it's hard when you got, um, 
you know, this, and, and we'll go into kind of the structure of semi-professional football in, in the US, but kind of hard when you have the summer with these kids and it's only a very short window, but then outside of it, what happens is that um, a lot of those kids have to get back to their, you know, college programs. And so they, you, have to, you have to pretty much scrap at, at times to for, formulate your teams, especially as you're going deeper into... Yeah, that's, that's what happens in the, the, the senior uh, program. Yeah, yeah, so I haven't changed their playoff structure yet to, to really fit in with the college season. So uh, when we made the, the national championship, we had lost uh, all of our players. So I only... I only had one sub for that for that match, and I met six of my players um, before the national championship at, at lunch before the national championship because uh, MPSO wouldn't allow us to to sign any new players. So I had to use guys that we had registered earlier in the season that had never even never even played for us. So it was a crazy experience, but um, you know, needless to say, we still made a run to the national championship. I just just wish we could add our our full team together at that point because it was a it was an incredible group of, of young guys it was it was a really fun fun run yeah it really it really was i think that um you know the interesting thing is that a lot of my own clients don't realize and you know that there's such a landscape in the u.s where you know you can continue to play at a collegiate level but at the same time, too, if you want that platform, which potentially acts as a bridge into the pro game through your summer months, you still have that platform. And, um, you know, I think uh, I think franchises like Midland and, and others, and obviously there's hundreds of these scattered around, you know, the U.S., potentially provide that. I mean, we'll get into that in a minute, but you know what? I wanted to cover a little bit more for those who have just joined. Again, we have the Blue Collar Footballer live and direct from San Antonio, Mr. Matt Barnes. Um, thanks to all, all of you for joining. But you know what, um, Matty, I wanted to cover you know, a little bit about yourself, right? Because a lot of people who might be joining and also you know, viewing this video I don't know too much about Matt Barnes and, and your background, but, you know, what was, what was, what was Matt Barnes growing up? Uh, I grew up in Southern California <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just been playing since I was five. And um, let's see, I ended up going to university just outside of Chicago in the greater Chicago land area and was able to play with a few guys from Southern California. We kind of went out together as a group and had a great experience in college. We won a couple national championships there. And, um, but yeah, grew up in, in Bakersfield, uh, California. So had kind of a, you know, very blue collar upbringing. That's where the name, you know, where my, where my tagline comes from. Just the, the way my family, you know, brought us up and, and everybody, Everybody worked hard, and uh, it, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of my background. Grew up in a real blue-collar uh, family and um, loved the game and was, you know, fortunate enough to, to still be in it, you know, you know, coaching or directing, whatever whatever role it's been. I'm still here and, you know, still learning every day. But, yeah, um, Southern California and then went to the Midwest for, for college. I played a, a year professionally uh, just before the MLS started. And then um, from – from Chicago, I ended up going back to Bakersfield, where I got on as an assistant at Cal State Bakersfield with a couple great coaches, Jeremy Gunn and Simon Tobin. So, yeah, so Jer Jeremy's... Wow. What's that? Well, that's how you met Yeah, so Jeremy and I were... were that's how you met Jeremy. ...under Simon in uh, 1997. We won a... National championship in Division Two at Cal State Bakersfield right before they went Division One. So I worked with Jeremy there, and um, you know, and, and Simon. So both both great mentors to me. And um, I mean, you've seen what Stanford's done the last few years. I still think Jeremy Gunn's the best in the business, and um, I've, I've I've learned a lot from him and and Simon as well. So yeah. I was really fortunate to be able to have have that experience as a young coach and then um yeah then i was i was teaching for quite a while and what about eight nine years ago i just decided i want to get back into football full-time and and was fortunate enough to 
um, to get a job. I left teaching and uh, I had started my own business in Bakersfield. Was teaching full time, running a running a soccer club, but I just wanted to do you know soccer full time. So uh, I got on uh, uh, at Emory Riddle, Aeronautical University in Arizona. And then uh, from there, just kind of uh, went through uh, a few different schools and was fortunate enough to turn some programs around um, that were struggling, and, and then uh, here I am today. So. You know, what about, it's interesting because California is such a hotbed for, uh, I guess, soccer talent in general, but you look at it, different parts of the country across the U.S. Uh, and typically, even for our recruits, I mean, California schools are typically hard to get into, right? And a lot of kids don't understand that because it's such a hotbed for soccer, you get such a, a stronger pool of uh, players that, you know, coaches can recruit, um basically directly out their backyard, right? So you mentioned yourself growing up in California. Who are your yeah, early days? Back in the before? early days where it just wasn't as, as popular as it is now. So there you know, we were in a climate where you could play outside year round, but probably the biggest influence on, on my on my career as a young player was my was my club soccer coach, a guy named Sal Salazar that really really took me under his belt and um, just taught me a lot about growing up and, and discipline. I remember a funny story about Sal. The, right after I'd made my, my first club team, we had a, a tournament in San Diego, and he told me, hey, you know, when, when you show up, you can bring one bag for the weekend. And um, and we showed up. And this is before we were even wearing seatbelts. <laughs> I got to his house. My mom dropped me off, and I had, you know, I had my one soccer bag. And then I had, I had another bag with all my clothes, my regular clothes in it. And my mom drove off and I waved and he waved to her. And, and then he turned around to me. He's like, which one of those bags has your soccer stuff in it? And I was like, this one. And he took my other bag and he threw it on top of his roof at his house. And uh, he said, get in the car, boy. I told you one bag. So I spent about seven days in San Diego in my, in my soccer gear. And um, so just kind of one of those, uh, one of those, fond memories I have just from a guy that really taught me about, you know, trying to do the right thing and, and showing up on time and, and uh, being respectful. And I learned a lot from Sal and it was, it was an awesome, awesome youth youth growing up with all those guys he would uh he would throw us all in the back of a station wagon and he pulled out the spare tire put a barbecue in there and we would just roll every weekend you know 12 of us in a in this big white blue uh uh station wagon we were called the blues brothers and i uh, ended up playing college with some of those guys and still talk to a lot of them to this day so it was a pretty pretty cool pretty cool experience for me And a lot of those guys. Yeah, there's, the a, there's a few of them. A lot of those guys that you grew up with. Um, not not necessarily to my level. One of the guys, uh, Ricardo Sal Salazar, called Kiki. He was a uh, he's a pretty pr uh, prominent uh, referee in the MLS. He called mo a lot of major games over the last few years and just just retired in uh, Kiki's in back in Bakersfield. But yeah, a few of the guys did some some good stuff from that team. So it was a really really interesting group of. Young guys, it was cool, and and I won. Like I said, I went to college with a few of them, so that's always cool when you go to college with some of your club teammates and winning national championship, you know, championships together. That was a, it was a really cool experience for me. So some of the guys that you actually played, we've ended up in the same yeah, I played college program. Yeah, like you, I played you were at NAIA. Johnson, was, uh, is that right? You know, the NAIA. NAIA. program in the NAIA under under Coach Steve Burke, and I, I wanted to play for somebody like that that was a legend. So yeah, we um, I played with actually my my club coach Sal. His both of his sons ended up uh, at Judson, so I got to play with uh, with Cowboy and Kiki 
there and a couple other guys from Bakersfield. So it was it was a pretty pretty neat thing. That's that's amazing. So you know, it's interesting because if I look at my own background growing up, you know, whether it be at a club level, whether it be at a kind of a, a junior elite level, all the way up to you know reserve team, first team football here in Australia, it's interesting that you know during a time, even like for yourself in the in the US, where football probably wasn't soccer wasn't um, as prominent uh, a sporting code. Um, it was interesting here in Australia, we, we always had these, I guess there was a generation of coaches that were coming up or floating about just coaching kids and doing very, very similar things like your coach uh, did while you were growing up, basically getting you know groups of kids and just you know bringing them in like family and nurturing them and, and helping, helping them grow as footballers and more importantly as, as as people as well so you know it's interesting to see that kind of transition from youth and then the bridge into college for yourself and then obviously into you know whether it be that you ran your own business and then outside of that now coming full circle and back in, in the you know this uh, wonderful game of football at, a, at, a, you know, at an international level you know it's interesting to, that, that you, you cover off those topics because I think from my perspective, I look at all of our clients in a way where we try to nurture them through a process, right? So when you say things like that, that really resonates because I think from my perspective, I look at our clients in the same way. We have to nurture them through a process, whether they start a little bit earlier in the recruiting cycle all the way through to then committing to a program and then being with that program over four years. You know, it's just it's just really, it resonates with me because that you know that whole process and journey. There's a rhyme and reason behind it, um, and all the interactions that you had throughout that helped you to get to where you are today. So, if you're watching, you know, uh, currently live here with um, with Matt Barnes, um, the blue collar footballer. He, um, he just uncovered a, a few key points just around, you know, this this journey that we take uh, into potentially, you know, the collegiate ranks of uh, soccer in, in the US and, and his own journey. And a lot of things really resonate in terms of the people that you interact with and, uh, and getting to a point where... You know, you're ready to jump into the college system, you know, having key influences in your life that help you kind of grow and evolve, um, just like Matt had, um, just like I had. It, it, it really builds a great platform as you bridge into, you know, uh, the college uh, soccer environment. So it's really, it's, it's interesting that you say that because those influences obviously help, you know, um, there's a lot of things happening in the world and a lot of craziness going on. You mentioned, you know, everyone's kind of on lockdown in different parts of the world and otherwise. What is it that you're seeing on the ground in the US in terms of, I mean, you're in and around San Antonio, there's a whole bunch of, you know, schools, colleges and otherwise in and around San Antonio. What's the vibe currently? The most part, people are just just sitting in not knowing what's going on. I've talked to a lot of coaches. I've talked to, you know, Johnny Clifford, who who, uh, who was with me at, at St. Mary's, who's currently at, at St. Mary's University here in town. And, and Johnny's, you know, just taken that program um, after I left to a, to a new level and done a great job. And I talked to him this week, and um, look, everything's just on hold. Um, recruiting, the NCAAs essentially put recruiting on hold. Um, I think it's the first time it's ever happened. This isn't something that's happened genera generationally or, or anything. It's, some, it, it's something that's, that we're all dealing with for the first time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. It, it, we, we talk about it all the time. I think there's, 
just like anything, I think the, the universities and schools are a business. I think there's maybe some smaller schools and, and schools that, that haven't taken care of finances as well as others that, that could be in a little bit of trouble. And, uh, and, and but for the most part, I think most schools will come through this yeah. and, and they'll be just fine. But uh, I, I think the biggest fear right now is just, you know, what's, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the, you know, their, their seniors uh, in, in uh, spring sports that they're losing their seasons right now? You know, do those, some of those players get to come back? And, and how does that, you know, how does that coordinate with players coming in? So there's a lot of questions right now. And, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure anybody really knows all the answers right now. But right now I would say everybody's really like we should be just, just more concerned about, you know, health and, um, and taking, you know, taking care of yourselves, taking care of your family. And then, um, you know, the jobs will, the jobs will sort themselves out. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I just don't know, John, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's, it's been, it's been pretty new and I've never been, you know, kind of sequestered or, or asked to stay in my home for an ex- extended period of time. I think there's a lot of uneasiness maybe in the, with, with college coaches and kids not knowing. But at the end of the day, like I said, look, I think we're all going to pull through this. I think the majority of schools will, will do awesome. And, um, you know, I, I'm confident. I st- I'm confident every day that we'll pull through this and it'll be fine. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm seeing it on my end and I've been posting a lot about it. I'm seeing a lot of reception from coaches in general. Um, where they have this downside and it, and it, it is a good time and I'm telling all of our clients to make sure that they're consistently connecting with the coaches that we've connected them with, right? So I think, it, you know, things that are important are, are continual communication and there are other things that you can point to from you know, from your perspective as, a, you know, a former collegiate coach that kids should be doing during this period because irrespective of corona or otherwise, it may still be that summer period, right? So, you know, there's still be downtime. Uh, kids might be going through a cycle of talking to coaches or have been, you know, are there anything, is there anything there like you can share with any of the viewers in terms of, you know, tips and, and otherwise that, you know, you could, yeah, you could probably, yeah, make, sure. probably I, mean, I think communication is really important. I keep saying this. I think you have to sell yourself in this game. Um, so this is a great opportunity to really, you know, our lives get so crazy sometimes that, you know, I think everybody's slowing down now. So, you know, start researching, start getting out there and put a, put a list of your top 10 colleges together and start doing research, research on those schools and, um, you know, reach out to coaches and learn more about, um, you know, what type of head coach is there? I think it's so important. You need to learn about these people. It's still a people business at the end of the day. So I think, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm you and I'm one of your clients right now, this is just an, an awesome time to sit back and laser focus in on, on what you want to do, set those goals, set those top 10, uh, you know, maybe universities and, and start researching and learning and reaching out to those coaches and talking to them and, and, uh, doing, doing discovery models. And, you know, I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for people just to learn right now and, and continue to, to plan for their future. So, uh, that, that would be my advice right now is, you know, obviously keep, keep your fitness up grades. You know, um, I think the tendency is, you know, you keep reading about everybody jumping on playstations and just hanging out right now, but stay on, stay on top of your grades. Even with our, our, uh, you know, six year old son, we're doing homeschooling right now and, and put a, a big emphasis on that. So stay up with your grades. I think you know, people don't realize how important your grades are and how much money that can put into your pocket someday. And, um, I was, uh, obviously a, a slow learner and late, late bloomer, but I, you know, I ended up being a, I was an all American in college. But I was also an academic all American and, and to this day, I'll tell anybody that I'm, I'm probably more proud of my academic all-American 
um, than, than anything else. I had to work so hard for that, and it's something on my resume to this day that it's it's probably helped me more out in life than being a good you know being a good footballer. But yeah, study, man, stay on top of stuff in these in these down times. Don't let it slip. That would be uh, some advice from me. Yeah, and I think, you know, the key points there are the reason why I'm saying to these clients of ours is that, you know, hey, stay active, make sure that you're communicating because a lot of these kids might, might be a year or two out, right? And they've already started some dialogue. Um, those who are, uh, I guess, in their recruiting window at the minute. And, you know, you just can't keep your foot off the pedal, right? You know, a lot of kids kind of get into this cycle of, okay, well, I've just got connected with the program and then I'll kind of sit back. I always ask them, I'm always on top of them, hey, tell them what you've been doing. You know, um, yeah, even with the downtime, you know, if you hey, I'm working out, um, you know, like you said, I'm sitting down and studying if I'm, you know, a year out and doing practice exams for the SAT online and things like that. So, you know, they're all really key points, man. I, I think it's so important that, you know, these kids are... Uh these kids get an understanding that, you know, they're building platforms leading up to them, you know, being selected and moving into the college market in the US so good key points you know what what's interesting and you know we 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 the first thing we did face to face was you know um, Midlands so you were head, head coach then uh, with uh, Midland Odessa I think they were called Soccer's FC back then now they're called Midland FC I think I, I think that's that's the the, the, the franchise's name currently, but there is a, I guess, a very large opportunity for those players who during their summer months have a downtime um, in the US to be able to play at, at a very strong level across these semi-professional franchises. In actual fact, from my perspective, I've taken a lot of time for those kids who are very interested to start connecting dots with, you know, the semi-pros and, uh, and, and making sure that they understand that, that that could be a platform if they invest in that over, you know, a period of time to be able to go into um, or be seen by, you know, professional clubs in the USL and, and the MLS. Do you want to give me some kind of, or give the viewers a little bit of a background about how you came into like being an NPSL coach and pro coach whilst you were still a collegiate coach and, you know, some of the uh, kind of the dynamics behind how those franchises work, but then also what kind of platforms they can actually provide a college soccer player when they're going through this process of kind of studying and yeah, playing. Yeah, uh, I'm a huge fan of this. Just look, at, at the end of the day, when you're when you're playing in college soccer, you're going to get, what, maybe 20, 20 to 25 games a year, right? And then we, we keep asking, how does how does this college soccer career translate into a professional career? When, when your pros are playing for 10 months and, you know, 40, 50 games a season, it's, it's, it's hard to keep that level up and prepare when you do that. So it's always been, for me, the reason I got in, involved in the, in the USL and the uh, NPSL was, you know, it's a bridge for future professionals. So I knew it, as a college coach, if I could coach at that level, that could also bridge me as a coach, you know, to the, to the next level as well. So that's why I got involved in, in, in it. I, I was lucky. enough to be, I was coaching at um, 
uh, in Texas, and I, I had a call from Midland, and they asked if I'd be interested in the job, and I went and did a presentation for them, and, and kind of uh, made the, the core decision that I only wanted to work with college age, you know, future professionals, and I stuck to that pretty uh, pretty strictly when I was at Midland, and um, you know we were fortunate enough to do, enough to do really well. And look, so many of those guys have gone on to to professional careers. There's there's a there's a ton of them, and um, a lot of them would uh, you know would tell you that that part of it not not the full reason they're professionals, but part of it was because they went and played in the summer. So now they're getting the college season, uh, you know, with 20, 25 games. They're getting another potentially 20 games in the summer. And um, and now they're getting a little bit of a feel of what it's like to, you know, take care of your body over the course of, you know, 10, 11 months in a, in a year and keep your fitness up. And, and you know, how do you manage keeping high levels of uh of play and concentration over the course of a, a full year. So I would tell anybody that's in college now that if they're serious and they really want an opportunity to play professionally, they need to find a, a good program in the summer um, in, in play. And now if in the vote, uh, the NCAA is supposed to vote on Division One. This uh, well, April is coming up. The votes in April. I don't know if that'll get yeah. postponed, but um, you know that's going to change the makeup of the summer platform a little bit as well yeah. because the Division One players won't. You know, I'm, I'm assuming they won't get to play as much in the summer, if at all. But yeah, I would I would strongly encourage anybody to uh, to try to get out there and find a, a, a good summer program and and play and get those matches in. Yeah, yeah. We said we kind of had probably several of our guys who were in the in the uh, you know signed on with semi pro franchises. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with the league. I don't think they even made an announcement as yet because I know some of our uh, recruits who have signed on with franchises are still kind of waiting to figure out. Have, have you had any news over there in regards to what's Yeah, you know what, I just, I just talked to um, a couple of them. Um, I still talk to the, the Midland guys and the Laredo crew pretty actively. And uh, I know as far as the MPSL, they haven't made an announcement yeah. yet. I think they're waiting to kind of follow along and, and see what the, the MLS and some of the other, the USL are going to do. Um, but they don't start till May. Most of those games start in May. So I think they're still, uh, even though there's not been an announcement, they're still pretty... Um, you know, pretty hopeful that the season will be able to, to get going. So, um, but no, they have not made a decision yet. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting times. So, I mean, I'd say that things are, things are certainly going to come to pass pretty over the next several months at least, I guess. So, you know, I'm hoping that the league kind of the, uh, gets back and, and gets running again. You want to talk about, you know, because a lot of kids just don't really understand when what this semi-professional setup kind of looks like, right? Um, so what we know of, we have the MLS, which could effectively, you know, at a professional level be called Division 1. You have USL underneath that. You have some other kind of pro leagues floating about as well. But then outside of that, you have a pure, uh, a, uh, a bunch of different semi-professional leagues. So you have the USL 2, you have the NPSL, and there's a few others uh, in the mix. So how, does, how do those leagues intertwine the semi-professional leagues intertwine with the pro leagues, and and how how how, yeah, how do they kind of work because they're given a new level since I was coaching. So now you basically have four tiers, right? So the MLS sits at the top, and then you have the USL Championship that sits right underneath that. So that would be like your first top two tiers, and then under that, the USL started uh, um, USL USL one. And then below that in the fourth tier, you can have USL, USL2, and the MPSL now. It used to be called the PDL. Um, but those are the top two, you know, amateur 
amateur leagues. I would say between the two leagues, there, there's in and around 100 teams from coast to coast in each of those. So you have a couple hundred, you know, uh, fairly legit, legitimate, you know, semi-pro organizations. Now, out, out of those couple hundred, um, you know, it de- depends on where you're at in the U.S. about who's who's better, who's stronger. Um, in Texas, in the Texas region, the, the MPSL is head yep. of uh, the USL. And, and, and you can probably flip-flop that in other regions. I think the West is pretty strong in, in the USL side. But it differs. And, again, it goes back to doing your homework. And with 200 organizations out there, there's, there's some that are almost like pay-to-play, and there's others that are very, very yeah. professional. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked with Laredo recently in, in what they do for their – their players is incredible. You know, they, they set them up in apartments. They, uh, you know, they're, they're earning a little bit of money during the summer. They feed them. Midland's the same. The two organizations I'm really so familiar with are, are housing and, uh, and feeding the guys all summer. They're putting them in professional atmospheres. They're, they're playing in front of fans. They're, they're meeting with sponsors. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're really part of almost a, a professional organization. So it's, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's good if you get in the right environment. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realise it. I certainly saw it myself when I drove out to Midland. I mean, we were joking about it, right? Middle of nowhere. Um, but, you know, just rocking up and seeing the infrastructure. I talked to these kids who were keen on this pathway about just how much infrastructure the, the better run franchises have. Oh, yeah, everything that you need. And we've had, obviously, uh, Euro... Uh, Dragicevic, our, our kind of standout goalkeeper, one of our clients here at number 90. Um, uh, time with Laredo and, and, you know, just hearing that, uh, I think, you know, a lot of kids just don't realise that a lot of these semi-pro franchises are, are, are run like a professional setup. Um, you know what, what's interesting, and I heard this even in the NPSL, is it correct to say that they're, um, they are extending the actual season because you mentioned something about, I know Sasha Sorosky was at Maryland, one of the chairs of the NCAA got a committee, the steering committee for extending the Division One kind of season. Is that in sync? Is that is that the reason why the MPS, I, I read somewhere about the MPS kind of extending, extending its season. And how will that affect, I guess, these college athletes um, being able to kind of play during their summer months yeah. if the no, season is extended in the NCAA? The, the Did you hear anything about that? Because of the, what we ran into in 2017 where all the college players couldn't play in the national championship, they moved their, they, they shortened their season. So they moved the championship game yeah. up a week. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of unknowns right now, um, John, but I'll just, I'll just go back to saying, look, even, even when I was coaching, you know, we had, we had some great relationships with professional teams. The, the year that we went to the national championship, we had a, we had a guy that, uh, yeah. And that came right back to San Antonio and jumped into the USL championship for, for the rest of the season. And I know Laredo's committed to sending uh, one of their players out at the end of the season. They're, they're, they're going to select a player to send on a, on a trial in, in Europe with us at, in, at Helsinger. So I, I do think there's some legitimate opportunities out there if you're at the right club. And there's a lot of really good clubs in, in both of those organizations. So let's cover off some things here um, in terms of your journey, right? So you talked about, you know, being a collegiate soccer player, coming through those ranks, being, uh, you know, having kind of coached also um, at a very high competitive level amongst standout coaches in the collegiate game today. So we've got Jeremy Garner, Stanford, and otherwise you interacted and worked closely with um, those kinds of coaches who, inevitably became your uh, mentors uh, in the game. Uh, transitioned into collegiate coaching, um, you know, successfully turning around a lot of these uh, programs that you uh, that you kind of took over. That, that's an interesting topic for me as well because I see it so many times. There's a lot of transition, a lot of churn amongst coaching ranks into different schools at a collegiate level. 
but you see that there are programs, and I've been in the game now for 10 years, there are programs that you would never have heard of on the national stage if you do, you know, a track of rankings and otherwise across different divisions in the NCAA and AIA or otherwise. No one would have heard of those programs, you know, years and years ago, but now they're kind of getting into the national scene. So what I'm seeing a lot more of are these younger coaches, and in particular, this is really interesting, a lot of European-based coaches, guys who played in the elite level in Europe, probably played in the collegiate level, um, were standout kind of college soccer athletes themselves, but now they're taking over programs that probably didn't have a strong history uh, in terms of being extremely competitive and turning those things, you know, those programs around. Uh, do you see a lot of that? Do you see that there's been, you know, a lot of the old firm kind of powerhouse college programs uh, are finding that with a lot of these kind of European players and and, and European coaches entering into the college system that, uh, you know, they, they have to fight pretty hard to, you know, compete. And, uh, and has that kind of transition really um, improved the quality at a collegiate level? That's a question, isn't it? Um, I, uh, <laughs> look, I'm, yeah, I know. You know I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to throw it of, uh, There's a lot of great American coaches out there too. There's um, there's some fantastic ones. I would say yes. I think the turnover happened at some point. So there's more and more really young coaches that are getting an opportunity that have that they've been around better coaches. They've been around better, you know, tactical. Uh, they have better tactical ideas. Uh, they know how to run a program kind of holistically, if that makes sense. It used to be, you know, just you, you come in a college soccer program, they beat the crap out of you and they spit you out. Now, there's just so many more guys out there that are understanding this is this. There's so much more to it. Um, so I think the more uh, the better coaches that we get, you, you look at the the guys that, you know, have coached under Simon Tobin, like all these guys he's produced over the last 15, 20 years. You know, we all end up going out and just trying to make places better, and then guys work under us, and then those guys get job opportunities, and that's happening all over the place. You know, and look at the look at all the coaches Indiana's produced, and you brought up uh, Swarovski. You look, you, you keep looking at some of the greats, and they they produce younger guys that are aggressive, and they're going out and doing this elsewhere. So yeah, I think you're right. I think I think the game's getting it's it, it's getting more global. It's getting better from a from a tactical standpoint. It's getting better from a periodization standpoint and um and, and i think there's more and more coaches understanding that we have to treat and coach and, and and educate people holistically it's not just about football anymore we we have to we have to address people as the whole package and and that's uh you know it's one of the things we always try to do in all of our programs that's what the blue collar logo kind of embraces is it's it's not just about football you know i i always say my you know, my goal was always to produce blue collar, a blue collar mentality or a blue collar man for a white collar world. So we know if we can, if we can get guys to show up on time and, yeah. and work and overcome adversity and be a great teammate, um, we know if we can, you know, kind of implement all these ideas in their head and send them out into the, the white collar world with their degree, dude, we know, we're, we know they're going to be successful. So um, and I and I think there's more and more of that going on now to yeah. answer your question. I think it's a good time to be in, in college athletics in the United States. You know, I'm seeing a lot of our kids really, especially when they come back through the summer, they're different players, you know what I mean? Like, we assess them here, say, if they come to any of our training sessions or we travel to different parts of the world around sessions so we can actually assess the level and the quality. They don't know what they're getting into prior. We have to educate them. But when they transition over and they make that commitment, if they're under a great coach and they're being trained at a very high level, they, uh, may, when they come down here, they, they, you know, I see them play maybe in the summer months, they come back and they you know, kick the ball around or otherwise just different athletes and at a different level mentally. 
on, on so many fronts, whether it be, you know, not just as a player, but as people as well. So all those things come into mind, right? There's so many great coaches out there. And like you said, you made a great point. You've got American-based coaches like yourself, and you're always learning and evolving. Like, I think your journey, um, and just to keep a track on time, probably got about 14 minutes or so, so I'm going to try and cover a little bit of ground. But um, your journey was collegiately uh, as a coach, but then you took a, you took a kind of a, a, a segue at, at one point, you know, you, you took a turn where you saw opportunities happening, uh, you know, uh, at a national team level. So maybe you want to talk about that experience, mm-hmm. uh, being the head coach for Turks and Caicos, um, and then how that helped bridge an opportunity for you to now become a sporting director. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll try. It's still, you want to, you want to cover some of that? Background? I don't know how I've you know got to where I am either. It's been a it's been a pretty crazy journey, but. Look, I think I think the the success we had in in the MPSL and the PDL specifically, we had a back to back run there. Where you know, uh, in 2016, we made the national semifinal in the in the uh, in the PDL, and then and then our club made the decision to go to the MPSL. We went to the national championship. So, you know, we were arguably the most successful you know program in the U.S. over those those couple years. We had some great runs and. And, and, and great teams, and that kind of that kind of jumped my name up into some other opportunities, basically. And one of the opportunities I got, I had a call from the U.S. Virgin Islands um, from their president, and uh, I ended up being a finalist for the U.S. Virgin Islands job. And I and I put a full uh, you know presentations together and built some ideas for them, and I ended up not getting the job at the U.S. Virgin Islands for the national team. And um, out of that, uh, my name came in to, uh, uh, to the Turks and Caicos national team job. Uh, so I, I flew to Turks and Caicos and, and had a little bit better idea of what I was, you know, doing after going through some interviews at that level and, you know, was lucky enough to be offered the job there. So we, uh, we took Turks and Caicos through the Gold Cup qualifying um, and it was a you know phenomenal experience for me. Now, uh, over the course of time, I had met a, a good friend of mine named Jordan Gardner when I was at San Francisco State, and Jordan um, was coaching a men's team at that point. And uh, Jordan and I got to know each other there. He went on to become the general manager for uh, a PDL team on the West Coast. And long story short, we've stayed in touch, you know, over the years. And uh, Jordan's the one that put this this project together in Europe. So he went out and got uh, uh, a pretty significant group of American investors together. Uh, we have about 13 investors in the club right now, maybe, maybe, maybe even closer to 15. Um, we have, you know, s- some people that are, uh, you know, on, uh, on the board and the NBA, um, we have some pretty, pretty prominent ownership groups. So Jordan got the, this group of owners together and, and ultimately made the decision to buy a club in Denmark, um, FC Helsinger. So right when we got uh, a hold of the club in, in Helsinger, uh, right at the end of last season, they were kind of on a slide. They'd gone from the Superliga and been relegated, and they were at the bottom of the division. We couldn't save it, so we got relegated with six games to go after we got control of the club, and we're sitting in the second division right now. So um, Jordan actually had flown into Turks and Caicos and had, had witnessed one of the – you know, we won the first qualifying game in 11 years in that country. We were at that point – uh, ranked the worst team in FIFA. We were ranked 210 in the world. And, uh, yeah, we, we won our first international qualifier wow. in 11 years and the first win of any kind in four years there. And we climbed up the FIFA rankings. And luckily, you know, Jordan had flown out for that match and got to witness it. It was one of the, the, the it just one of the coolest moments of my life. But, you know, after that, he sat down with me and said, hey, I've put this ownership group together. We're looking at this club. I want to know if you'd be interested in doing this. And I just thought, you know, John, I've, you know, I, I got into this business because I wanted to do something great. And um, I, I, you know, was one of the only Americans to ever coach a national team of a foreign nation. And then, you know, probably I'm guessing one of the only guys ever, if not the only American to be, you know, a sporting director in Europe. So um, I, I would say a lot of luck has come, come along with it, but. 
um, you know, th th that's how I got there, basically. And are you seeing um, that in your recruiting cycles, and obviously as you're recruiting players, are you recruiting a mix of older and younger players? And is there a, is there a, I guess a pathway there potentially for those very elite kind of collegiate athletes who might have been playing collegiately at an elite level than playing potentially at an elite level in the semi-pros and otherwise. And, you know, you got your feelers out in different parts of the world via your network. Are you actually seeing that there's an opportunity uh, for kids to get, if they're playing at the very, very highest level and, and competing at the highest level to, to to get into a, a setup like Helsingor, obviously, I'll be the first to say that it's extremely difficult because I'll be there at Yeah, myself, so I think like anything in my role, um, I, you know, I have the sporting director title, but a big part of my job is the, is the, you know, especially now is the identification of, of kids from North America, and especially in, in the United States. So my, you know, a big part of my job this coming season will be to identify some good quality young players in the United States and give them that opportunity in Europe. Uh, I would say all of us, like like any new job you take, there's a huge learning curve. I think, you know, we, we made some mistakes. We're, we're learning on the run. Uh, I've set up a couple strategic partnerships now in the U.S. where we're identifying players. And a big, big part of that, John, is looking at the, at the college ranks because I still think, uh, especially at the level in the second division currently that we're at, probably, you know, most likely promoting to the first division next year. Uh, I still think the, uh, the top college player can manage that. I think they can make that jump from college. If they're in a top program, they're playing in the summer. Um, I, I do think there's a, a big opportunity for some of those guys. Um, we, we were close to signing a couple this year that, that were in the, the, the MLS draft. Uh, two players, uh, you know, in particular that we, we thought we were going to get over on trial. They ended up signing contracts in the MLS, um, both great players. But, yeah, I would say there's uh, there's still a huge opportunity if, if uh, um, you know, if guys come to the U.S. And I, I think the misconception is that you come to play, you know, college football and then your professional aspirations are over. And I, I don't think that's the case at all. I, I still think, you know, no matter what people say, the, look, the, the yes. facilities, the infrastructure, the support that some of these college programs have are better than uh, a majority of, you know, even professional clubs in Denmark. There's some amazing programs in the U.S., and, and if you find the right one, you're lucky enough to get there. You can get yourself under a staff that knows how to coach and teach and take care of you. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a big opportunity for some young kids coming out of college. And I would say, uh, you know, if anybody's following us in the next year, you'll probably see us sign, uh, you know, I'm hoping a college a player may, may be coming out early, but um, somebody with some college experience getting into the professional ranks in, in Denmark with us specifically. Okay. Well, that's, that's fantastic news, and it's great to see that kind of flow and effect and the fact that you say that the, the collegiate system is, is strong enough to be able to develop these players to play at that level so that's uh, quite key I'm very conscious of time probably around about five minutes left so what I'm going to do is take a question that we had here a great question from Coach Mixi is asking you Matt what advice do you have for young coaches that want to coach higher levels such as college and post that, um, we're going to probably have to wrap up. So any advice that you can give to... Uh, yeah, for sure, grind. To Coach I think here. that's what we're missing in this in this day and age with a lot of young coaches. We keep seeing guys that want to come out and they want big paychecks and they want big responsibilities right away. And um, that's not how it works. So get in, get to know people, network. If I, if I could go back and give advice to my younger self... I would network, network, network. I would get out. I would get to know people. I would let people get to know me, let them see my work ethic. I think uh, my, one of my problems and why my career stalled for a while is I just kept thinking people would see, hey, this guy's winning and doing great everywhere he goes. And it's not like that. you you got to get out and share. you got to be open. Uh, you got to work your ass off, John. you got, you got to get out there and, and find your own opportunities. So, yeah, I would say for a young guy, uh, network, network. Um, 
surround yourself with people that know what they're doing, right? Surround yourself with greatness. And look, be willing to go out and work. I worked for two years at Cal State Bakersfield for free, um, you know, and, and that's that's been an important learning, you know, uh, launch pad for me in my career. So, yeah, be willing to go out and, and go the extra mile and work and do whatever it takes and, uh, and find some great people to surround yourself with. Well, that is really solid advice and words of wisdom from none other. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining this live chat. None other than the blue-collar footballer himself, Mr. Matt Barnes, all the way from San Antonio, Texas. We've covered kind of so much ground here. Um, Matt, you can find Matt on Instagram at, at right. yep. blue-collar uh, footballer. Is that right? Same, same uh, tag on Facebook. That's right. So follow, um, follow his journey. Yeah, follow his journey on uh, Instagram and, and the same tag on Facebook. Uh, thank you one and, uh, one and all for joining from all around the world, listening in to this live interview with none other than Matt Barnes. What we're going to do is we're going to wrap it up.